The aftermath of an overnight attack on a Syrian airfield, a major turning point in the conflict, now entering its seventh year, the first direct strike by the United States against the Syrian regime. Tomahawk missiles fired from a warship and aimed at an airbase. Tonight I ordered a targeted military strike on the airfield in Syria from where the chemical attack was launched. It is in this vital national security interest of the United States to prevent and deter the spread and use of deadly chemical weapons. There can be no dispute that Syria used banned chemical weapons. The attack is the U.S. response to pictures like these. Syrian civilians, victims of exposure to nerve gas, an apparent chemical attack being blamed on the Assad government. It denies it carried out that attack and is blasting the U.S. military action. The United States of America at 342 hours this dawn carried out an act of aggression, targeting one of our bases in the Central Command with a number of missiles. As a result, six of our personnel were killed, others wounded, gross damages suffered. The Pentagon believes chemical weapons have been stored at the base. They say the attack did not target areas where Russian forces were believed to be present. But Russia says it was an act of aggression and could damage talks to end the war in Syria. What happened will benefit those who want to undermine negotiations in Geneva and Astana and create a pretext for a shift from a political solution to the military change of the regime. It all further damages the U.S.-Russian relations. I hope this provocation will not lead to irreversible consequences. We will have to make our conclusions about the future relations with Washington. But on the streets of Syria, some are calling for more U.S. action. Hitting one airbase is not enough. There are plenty of others in the region. There are the Hama and Aleppo airfields and others. And they're all targeting us in the liberated areas. We hope more will be done, God willing. We hope this will continue, but we hope it won't become a game against the Syrian people and our country. The military strike, a major change in the United States-Syria policy is likely to start a new chapter in this complicated war. Whitney Hurst, Al Jazeera. We are learning more this morning about the missile attack ordered by President Trump on an airbase in Syria. U.S. allies are praising the move while Syria and Russia denounced it. Welcome back to CBS This Morning. We're, of course, on top of this story, and there's new video overnight that shows the aftermath of the early morning strike. Syrian officials say at least seven people died in this attack. There were two Navy destroyers in the Mediterranean that fired 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles. President Trump says the Syrian base launched Tuesday's chemical weapons attack that killed more than 80 people. It is in this vital national security interest of the United States to prevent and deter the spread and use of deadly chemical weapons. There can be no dispute that Syria used banned chemical weapons, violated its obligations under the Chemical Weapons Convention, and ignored the urging of the UN Security Council. CBS News senior national security contributor Michael Morrell was deputy director of the CIA. And CBS News senior national security analyst Fran Townsend was homeland security advisor to President George W. Bush. Good morning and welcome to both of you. Fran, let me start with you. What are the implications of this strike? Look, I think in, in a single sentence, we saw President Obama draw a red line. We saw President Trump enforce it last night. Um, and that gives him leverage. This has been a horrific violation of international norms, that is Assad's use of chemical weapons. And so the president acted not only in U.S. national interest, but in the interest of our regional allies. He was with the King of Jordan, clearly was moved both by the pictures coming out and the, the tremendous threat that this poses to the stability of Jordan. Michael, what message does this send to Assad and to the world in general? So he will look at the, the target set, right? 
The target set was a single airbase used for the chemical weapons attack. So the message Assad will take is, I cannot use chemical weapons again. He will get that message. This will deter him. But we did not go after regime command and control. Um, so that will also send him a message that we are not going to try to force him out militarily. So he will, he will read both of those messages. Is it risky for him to read it that way? In other I, words, might in fact uh, these things escalate so that there is a regime change plan? So I think he will continue to use his conventional forces to go after his own civilians and to go after the opposition. Th that killing will continue. And if we want that to stop, we need to put additional pressure on him. Uh, Fran, should he have done more? I mean, they, he's getting praised from most of the world. Uh, secondly, he's getting praised for the way it was executed, fast and with secrecy. Right. Look, Charlie, I, you know, when you talk to sources inside the administration, they say the driving principle was proportionality. One, you didn't want unnecessary civilian casualties when what you were doing was retaliating for the horrific civilian casualties. Two, you wanted to be careful not to be hitting other sites. Look, there are six major airfields. We only hit the one from which they launched this awful chemical attack because what you didn't want to do is hit potential other stockpiles and cause a plume where, where you cause the release of sarin or chlorine gas. Uh, Michael, this is a chance for uh, the Secretary of State to really see what his relationship with Vladimir Putin is when he goes to, on Tuesday to Moscow. This is going to be a very important trip. Um, the Russians bear significant responsibility for what uh, President Assad has done in Syria to his own people. They bear responsibility for the chemical attack um, last week, and it's going to be very important for Secretary Tillerson to make that clear to Putin and to make it clear that his support for Assad has to stop. What determines what the U.S. does next from here, Fran? Michael, to you too. Fran, you go first. Well, I, look, I think what you're going to see, I know that the administration is now looking at how much of the underlying intelligence are they willing to declassify to allow Nikki Haley to make the case in the U.N. Security Council. We've seen lots of sort of statements of support from allies and partners around the world. Um, and so the question is, not only is this a U.S. responsibility, right, to, to deal with the, the civil war and the fallout and the instability it's causing regionally and to our European allies, but what are our partners willing to do now? Um, we need more than statements of support if we want to change the, the, the civil war in Syria. And so I think you're going to see sort of the pulling together of the coalition in the region, the Saudis, the Jordanians, the Emiratis. What are they willing to do to actually now use this as a leverage point to turn the tide there? Michael, speaking about leverage, what are other ways that the U.S. can scare Assad, additional types of strikes, tactical strikes at his closest assets? So the president sent a very strong message to Assad and to everybody else in the world, you can't use these weapons. He gets very high marks for that. Um, he could get even higher marks that if he uses this as an opportunity to bring the world together, to put pressure on Assad, to come to the negotiating table and end the civil war in Syria once and for all. He has an opportunity to do that, and I hope he does it, and it has to start in Moscow next week. But you've talked about perhaps bombing presidential aircraft on the, on the ground, his helicopters, his um, office buildings. So, Nora, that's what I meant earlier when I said we did not go after um, regime command and control targets. We did not go after targets that would send him a message that he has to go. Um, and I actually think it would have been good had we done that last night. Um, we didn't, so we're going to have to find other ways to put pressure on him. Uh, if, if this succeeds, uh, because the president constantly refers to the red line and President Obama, if this succeeds, uh, it will one more cause questions about you have to make sure you are, if you make a statement, you're willing to back it up. That's right. And, and I do think this puts sort of very explicit pressure now on those we also have pol national security issues with, the Iranians who are supporting the Assad regime, the Russians. By the way, if I was North Korea, this is the timing of this while President Xi is here gives impetus to that conversation with the Chinese. Look, we're willing to act alone. That may not be our preference, but we need you to act with us. In this particular case, Michael, do you think the U.S. should wait for other countries to join in before there are additional attacks against Syria, if that is the conversation? One of the, one of the, <laughs> the important successes last night was that the president acted decisively. Mm -hmm. He didn't take weeks to try to bring other people on board. 
That's a message that is going to be heard not only in Syria and, and in the region, but as Fran said, around the world. I think that's very important. Um, and so I would encourage not waiting for others to join. Um, I would encourage the president to continue to act decisively. Michael Morell and Fran Townsend, thank you. Severe weather is a threat today from South Carolina to New Jersey. And in the northeast, in the northeast, it's still called that, flood watches and warnings are in effect. Mark Straussman is in Western Georgia, where a reported twister tore through several buildings. Mark, good morning. Good morning. When the manager of this agriculture store heard bad weather was heading this way, he sent home all of his employees just in case. A good thing, because 90 minutes later, the storm was here, and this is what the business looked like. Our twister ripped through this rural area, and whatever it hit, it hit with punishing power. Big tornado, big, big tornado. Tornadoes, hail, flash floods, and high winds caused damage from the deep south to the Midwest on Wednesday. At least nine reported twisters touched down, one destroying several buildings in South Georgia. The top on the home house started uh, peeling off, so we knew it was a very serious storm. High winds toppled trees and crushed this pickup truck and a mobile home. It could be much worse. So I'm very thankful that it's not. Hailstones, some as large as baseballs, pounded neighborhoods, even peeling the paint off homes. Along Atlanta's Peachtree Creek, this truck became trapped in rising floodwaters. Five city workers were stranded, and first responders used rafts to rescue them. Drenching rains caused flash flooding near Columbia, South Carolina. Lightning struck across the region and is believed to be responsible for starting several house fires. Everything I know of is damaged in there. They said they almost think they can salvage anything. We are asking you to evacuate the ground. At the Masters Golf Tournament in Augusta, the severe weather caused the cancellation of Wednesday's Par 3 contest for the first time ever and forced hundreds of people to leave. Two people were hurt, but no one was killed by these storms. But the impact was felt north at Atlanta's airport, where hundreds of travelers, uh, stranded travelers, had to spend the night. Uh, the local forecast is uh, clear the rest of this week. Good news for the Masters tournament at Augusta, Georgia, for all the players and all the fans watching them compete. Nora? Absolutely, Mark. Thank you so much.